The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter. Glory, Glory to you, you, O Lord. Lord. Some Pharisees came, and to test Jesus they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? And they said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. And for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Then in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated, and the children, grades two and younger, can go with Miss Heather and Pastor Andrew for children's time. grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, it would seem that I have jumped from the frying pan and into the fire. For uh, last week, our gospel text included words from Jesus saying, if your hand or foot or your eye causes you to sin, cut them off and tear them out. And I chose to preach on something else. But this week, we have the gospel reading where some have come to ask Jesus about divorce. And as soon as we hear the D word, your minds have gone to, well, uh, the reality of your own divorce or the divorce of someone you know and in fact one commentary said that as soon as you say the word divorce there are little bubbles over everyone's head of, with sermons of what they have heard about divorce in fact I'm pretty sure that if I asked you to raise your hand if you or someone you know has been divorced that most hands would be raised so I'm not going to do that <laughs> but that does bring a lot of feelings and emotions into this room today and I invite you to take a breath to metaphorically take a step back as we explore some of the original understandings in the context of this conversation in our scripture today and discover how it fits in the bigger scheme of things in the gospel according to Mark first to note is the friction with which this text begins some came to Jesus testing him. So right there from the beginning, there's something going on. There's a, a different motive, a hidden agenda. The question, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife, is a test. It, again, there's a hidden agenda here. There's a friction between Jesus and those who, who are unsure of him and what he's up to. And to be sure, there are some who want Jesus out of their way. Jesus is disrupting the way things have always been done. And so the motive, perhaps, is to, is to get Jesus in trouble with authorities, to get Jesus maybe into trouble with Herod. You might remember back in Mark chapter 3, the Pharisees <laughs> plotted with the Herodians for Jesus' downfall. Already there is a plot afoot. And then in Mark chapter 6, it reports the clash between John the Baptist and Herod over Herod's marriage to Herodias, his brother's wife. So there's a friction there from the beginning, and there's history leading to that friction. In, in, in the conversation from Mark chapter 6, John had said, is it, 
is it not lawful, it is not lawful for you to be married to your brother's wife. And, and if we remember that story, John ended up in prison and was beheaded. So if they can get Jesus to say something that goes against Herod, they would have the means to get rid of Jesus. So again, the verses start out with friction and tension right off the bat. There's a hidden agenda of testing Jesus. New Testament professor Donald Jewell has also pointed out that there's disagreement among the Jewish people. There's disagreement concerning when a divorce was permitted. In Deuteronomy chapter 24, it permitted divorce when there was something objectionable about the woman or the marriage. One school of thought that this unspecified something was infidelity. So only infidelity made the divorce possible. A whole other school of thought interpreted it more broadly to include a number of things like the way the wife looked or the way she cooked. So there are two different schools of thought. They didn't agree. And so by asking Jesus where he came down on this issue, those testing him were trying to peg him within their broader religious tradition. And so inevitably hoping that Jesus would inflame one side or the other and calls up a stir and they could build a case against him. So they're trying to get either this group or that group upset and at odds with Jesus. The chaos and disruption, again, we give evidence to get rid of Jesus, but in Jesus' fashion, right, in Jesus' fashion, he doesn't directly answer their question. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? In Jesus' fashion, he asks another question. He asks, what did Moses command you? And they acknowledge that Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce his wife. So there are two things to point out there. First, it's the man who divorces his wife. The woman does not ever have that option. Second, the allowance for the man to write a certificate of dismissal was a mercy concession, a mercy concession in order to protect the woman. Without that certificate, she has brought shame and embarrassment upon her family of origin. She would be an outcast without protection, left to be a beggar. So the certificate gave her an opportunity to remarry and have the possibility for a future. So even in Moses' day, there was mercy to protect the woman who was considered to be among the weak and the vulnerable of society. That's a given, that's a known for that time. And so Jesus points out that the concession for the divorce was a result of the hardness of heart of those and those like them who have come to test Jesus. He turns the tables on them. It is a result of their hardness of heart. So while they were trying to trip up Jesus and get him to join one side or the other as to when divorce was permissible, Jesus goes all the way back to the beginning when relationships were created in the first place. And we might also understand that God is a relational God. And God created the world and all that is in it to live in relationship with God and with each other. And it should be no surprise to Jesus' contemporaries nor a surprise to us that God's intention was clear about the nurture and care of all relationships. After God created the man, God said it was not good for the man to be alone. Again, God's creating for relationship. And after creating the animals, God created the woman. So we also know that as that story continues, it didn't take very long for that relationship between God and the man and the woman to become strained. A couple of chapters later, Cain murdered his brother Abel. So God's intention for relationships to be nurtured and cared for turned out to be relationships that could easily be broken. A brokenness that we know in church speak as sin. It's a separation from God, a separation from creation, a separation from each other. My point is this. Of course, the God of relationship intended for relationships to be healthy, whole, life-giving, and life-sustaining. And since the beginning, God has been at work to restore creation, to restore humanity, to reconcile the world back to God. And ultimately, God sent Jesus to make this possible. When Jesus came into the world, he encountered a world of brokenness. The Gospels are filled with the stories of Jesus' encounter with broken people. 
people with sickness and disease, people who were hurting, who were weak, who were vulnerable, who were outcast, who were living out on the margins. Jesus came and is always working to heal, to restore, to raise up, to give new life. So you think about it, this text tells us that some came to Jesus to test him and they're asking about divorce. And with that motive, they got far more than they ever bargained for, pointing to their own sin as a hardening of the heart, of which everyone is capable. And yet to those who are in desperate need of a word of grace, those in need of some kind of hope that God's love and mercy can reach even them, Jesus embodies that love in their midst. Think of the woman at the well in John's Gospel, one who has had five husbands and lives with one who is not her husband. To her, Jesus proclaims God's loving embrace. So something bigger is at work in this story. And in the context of the whole second half of the gospel according to Mark, Jesus is teaching what it means for him to be the Messiah, the Son of God, and also Jesus is on his way to the cross. It is in this hard-hearted world that Jesus' reconciling mission is at work. The phrase, hardness of heart, is from the Greek word, Sclerocardia, sclerocardia, it literally hard heart. Our daughter Sarah has a skin condition, a form of scleroderma, meaning hard skin. And fortunately, it is limited to the skin. Another version affects the organs, and over time, the hardening of an organ results in death. Like arterial sclerosis, a hardening of the arteries. If you have it, over time, it will kill you. <coughs> Sclerocardia, hard-heartedness, think about it. As a relationship starts and continues to spiral, the heart, hard, the heart that is hardened toward the other person as the relationship is strained. And to its extreme, one who is hard-hearted is someone who is unable to love. One who is hard-hearted is someone who is unable to love. So in a way, that is what Jesus comes to save us from. Jesus comes to save us from an inability to love, an inability to love God and to love others. The gospel text also includes the scene of people bringing little children to Jesus in order that he might touch them. And at first it seems that this is out of place and it doesn't have anything to do with the previous verses. But the two scenes are connected. The children represent the most fragile and vulnerable people in that time and place. The mortality rate of children was such that two out of three would die before age 16. <laughs> So young children were seen weak, fragile, vulnerable. They didn't really have value until they were old enough and strong enough to contribute in some way. So the people bringing the children to Jesus saw him as a life giver and desired to have Jesus touch them. And when the disciples tried to shoo them away so that the grown-ups could talk, Jesus became indignant with the disciples and Jesus welcomed them with open arms and blesses them. As preacher David Lowes points out, it is to precisely these children, suffering, dependent, and vulnerable, that the kingdom of God belongs. The good news in this passage is that God regularly shows up to care for precisely those who are alone, dependent, vulnerable, suffering, disenfranchised, and hurting. God is most reliably present among the vulnerable, the hurting, the dispossessed, and if that's where we can find God, then that's probably where we should also find God's church. Extending grace and help and support and understanding and love for those who are down and out, for those the culture is prone to leave behind, those without power, those who are easy to miss or dismiss, 
For it is to such as these, Jesus says, that the kingdom of God belongs. And when we recognize our own dependence and our own vulnerability and see ourselves in those who suffer, Jesus seems to say, and then can we imagine and thereby receive his grace and his presence and his love being poured out to us and to all. Some came to Jesus in order to test him, and they asked if it was permissible for a man to divorce his wife. And Jesus expands that question. By his very presence, he is offering himself to heal and make whole the brokenness of not just individual relationships, but to reconcile the whole world back to God. Jesus has come to heal and make whole the brokenness that was caused by humanity's divorce from God. At times, we divorce God, and it is that brokenness that Jesus has come to heal. At this point in the gospel story, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, where he has been and continues to teach his disciples he will be betrayed, suffer, die on a cross, and three days later be raised from the dead. His death and resurrection opened the door for God's grace and mercy to restore humanity's relationship with God. This is the gospel message to the world. It is the message the church is called to preach and to proclaim. With our words and with our actions, it is the message that the church is called to embody as we nurture and care for and tend to our relationships as we welcome and embrace those who have been hurt or are vulnerable. For it is this message, the gospel good news, that softens our hearts and teaches us again how to love as God first loved us. Let God's word soften our hearts to teach us again how to love.